I'm going to use green now just to, just to have fun with a different color. I'm going to go on to the problem number two, which you should look at and uh, pause and maybe try to do it yourself if you want to. Um, we've got a curve. We want the integral over this curve of a one form, um, or explicitly p dx plus q dy plus r dc. And we started out with a realization that we were already using this notation. We already had a definition for this. But I want to make sure our new understanding that's going to be per hugely general and could integrate a 17 form in 37 dimensional space, um, that, actually, that that actually reduces to what we expect here. Okay? So the curve is explicitly parameterized by some r, vector function r. It's oriented, which is crucial. Okay. Um, just because this is oriented, okay, and um, and I want to see what our yoga would turn out to do here. Well, let's see. All righty, it's the integral over this curve, and here's our parameter. This is their analog of the phi that we had before, so we're just going to pull everything back. We have this form here. Now remember, one form here is like uh, s just s just stacks of planes here. And we're just can't. We're supposed to be just counting how many times the curve goes through the stack with an orientation as well. Okay, so let's see. That's supposed to be the integral of r star of p dx plus q dy plus r dc. Okay, and then that's supposed to be. I'm supposed to be able to take that r star and just take it apart. So that's r star p d r star x plus r star q d r star y uh, let's see if I can squeeze it in here r star r d r star z I know it's kind of the handwriting isn't, isn't so great but let me bring that up to the top here okay and so that's equal to okay that works um, so r star p, that's just p of r of t. And that's exactly the kind of thing we would get if this were the component of a vector field, for example. We'd evaluate it at x of t, y of t, z of t. That's all it does. And then d of, now r star x, remember that was just x of r of t. Well, you know, we usually just say that's x of t. Instead of creating the vector, oh, you can't even see that. Let's see. Let me just put that as a little side note. x of r of t means take our number t, create the vector, and then apply the function f of x equals x to it. Oh, that's just x of t. Again, this is this distinction between thinking of x of t as a variable or sort of an output of the curve, or here we think of the vector function as the output of the curve, and then x is the function that takes any old point in R3 and just re records the x-coordinate. It's just kind of a bookkeeping thing, really. There's some subtleties and maybe some, some deep stuff there, but we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so this is just d of x of t. Okay, now this is important. We've got, now that we've got, oh yeah, I, when, as soon as I pulled back, this is an integral on just the domain of the parameterization, just a to b. This is an integral on, on an ordinary interval in R, R1. And so this function x of t is now an interesting function because it has to do with how fast the x-coordinate of the particle that's moving in R3 changes as a function of t. So this d is going to be an interesting d to take. And then we're going to have to think about what's the analog of d in one dimension. And it's, of course, easier than in higher dimensions. So then q of r of t times d of y of t plus r of r of t d of z of t. And then all dt. Oh, no, I haven't done the dt yet. Just kidding. OK, that's, that's just expanding out these r stars. That's all it is. All it is. OK, now um, I'm going to suppress the r of t's here. I'm going to just remember that p needs to be evaluated at x of t, y of t, z of t, or in other words, r of t. And d x of t, well, let's see. What's the rule? It was uh, just the analog of the gradient. So in three dimensions, it was partial with respect to x dx, partial with respect to y dy. Well, here there's only one variable, just t. And so it's just going to be the derivative of that function x with respect to t times the one form dt, the basic one form dt, plus q. Now just there's one, this is just the analog of the gradient in one dimension, plus r dz dt dt. And that's exactly what we were starting with. And it's exactly how you just expand out 
the integral of a vector field, for example, over a curve. And so this really is an example uh, of that y general yoga, that we use this idea of pulling back, we make the pullback eat all the little individual pieces, and then the key thing is that d then ends up eating something interesting, and we use the formula for d of a function, and that's where all the derivatives come from. Okay, of the parameterization. Okay. Now, uh, let's see. Let's do three forms in this same video. Next problem. Take a look at that, uh, the first to two parts of that problem. Let's do three forms. Okay. Um, let's look at this. So here's our three. Okay. Now let's sketch. We put dz, layers of dz together. We put layers of dy together. This is intentionally going to be just rough and busy, and then I'll clean it up. Okay. So I've got these sheets going horizontally. I've got them vertically this way. And then I have sheets going this way in x. I've got the things that look like this. Okay. Just sliding in here. I know this looks like a mess. I'm not very good at drawing this particular picture. But so let's just sort of, let's try to redraw it knowing kind of what it should look like. It's got sheets going in every direction. Well, what that is, it's just kind of a cubical grid. So let me just draw a few cubes. Well, let me try to do it a little intelligently. So here's one layer of those cubes, and then there's going to be this other layer on top of it. It's just going to be a cubical grid throughout space. Okay. Some sort of uh, egg carton um, like structure isn't that the best word. That's that's what I got from. Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, but uh, really the um, the kind of carton, kind of packaging for uh, Christmas ornaments, like the ball-shaped Christmas ornaments. That's really what looks what this looks like. If you have like lots of layers, there's one little one little cubicle cell for each of those balls. Okay, um, and so we're going to call this just like we did with dx wedge dy. We're going to say, okay, if we draw all three pictures for dx, dy, dz individually on top of each other. <laughs> and hope that it means something, that's what we're going to define pictorially as dx wedge dy wedge, wedge dz. And then we'll have a more operational definition of how to integrate it and stuff like that in a minute. Okay, so let's look at b. Take a look at b if you haven't read it already. If you have some sort of 3D blob, okay, and I want to get some number that's analogous to what we were doing before. Well, analogous we had this idea of for one forms it was count the number of times it pierces through for two forms it was how many tubes of flux go through well here the analog is again it should be just counting count the number of little cells in this region E and there's this beautiful thing about that very similar to what I was talking about uh, before um, and that's that uh, you can do it without any scale, any numbers, or any scale factor on this this picture. Um, when I in the very first video, I was talking about how you need scale factors to do stuff with gradients and kind of traditional integrals, things like that. Um, here's what's going on. Here's what you can't do. If I don't give you a scale on the x, y, z axes. You might think, well, you're always supposed to give me a scale, but it's it's actually pretty pretty deep that you don't have to be given a scale for what we're doing here. Suppose you don't give me a scale, and then what you do give me is some numbers. Like, for example, if you just give me the number 1 all through this thing, you say integrate that function, all 1s, over this region, E, you can't tell me the answer visually. You can't even roughly approximate it because you don't know the scale of x and y and z. This could have volume a million, or one over a million, or one, or who knows what it is. But if I actually draw this egg carton shape in here, or the Christmas ornament carton, all you have to do is count. You can see from the picture what the answer is. So I know it might sound like a dorky way to say it, but there's actually some very, very deep and profound meaning to the fact that the picture gives the answer. Another way to say it is that dx wedge dy wedge dz 
carries its scale factor along with it. Okay, That's really a big meaning of differential forms, is that they're sort of souped up versions of functions in a way that carry their own scale factor along with it. Okay, um, So let's go down a little bit here. What about if you have um, something other than just dx wedge dy wedge dz? This is the picture is a little hard to sketch here, but it's something where you'd have this carton shape in one region of space with a certain density of cells. You know, this if I put dotted lines in here, you can see kind of see the cells inside. Okay, and then maybe these these things kind of get get tighter in some other region. And you get many more cells per unit volume. Um, and so this is where f is going to be small. And here's where f is going to be big. So and again, there it, it, you might have to just draw a little cell picture here, a little cell picture here. And there might not be a nice way that they kind of meld together into one sort of nice picture. Um, that's, um, that's the kind of thing with forms that it, it can be hard to, for them to melt. Now it turns out that for three forms, um, there is there is kind of a melding that, that always happens. But don't worry about that too much if you're trying to draw one of these pictures. You can draw the little, you know, it's like with the little stack pictures that we were seeing on the vector field analyzer. This is perfectly acceptable, okay, where you just have the little stacks and they're separated, okay. Um, although for three forms, you really should be able to meld them, come to think of it, okay. So, um, for D here, take a look at D. Um, somebody asked me, I've forgotten to mention this, but somebody asked me in class, uh, what about, is this associative? And of course, by writing it without any parentheses, I'm implicitly asserting that it's associative. Otherwise, uh, you wouldn't know whether this means this or this. Um, and we d I don't want to prove that. As I say, rigorously, there's various ways to approach it. And some people just, just define it to be true, basically. Um, so we could just say, hey, let's define it to be true. Um, and, but our pictorial understanding of how we got dx wedge dy wedge dz, remember what the instructions were, just draw them all on the same picture. It doesn't matter whether you do draw these two first, go get coffee, and then draw this one. Or draw these two first, go get a bagel, and draw this, and then draw this one. It, you get the same answer. So if that pictorial model is actually a good model, which it is, um, then that really does sort of say, okay, this is really an associative operation. It, it doesn't matter what the parentheses are. Now, the, an the, the anti-commutativity is going to be very interesting. So, for example, dy wedge dx wedge dz. Okay, let's temporarily put some parentheses on there. Ah, that's minus dx wedge dy wedge dz. Okay, and that, in fact, has a lot to do with Part E here, let's go up to that. Part E asks, could I create anything else? I've, I've taken dx wedge dy wedge dz in that order, and then I put a function in front of it to make the, the cells get bigger or smaller in various places. Is that the only example? I've, there must be many other examples. Three forms must be abundant and complicated. Well, let's think about it. Um, I claim that the only way to create a three form, and this is kind of a big claim, but again, it, a lot of treatments actually just define it to be true, um, is to take dx, dy, dz, and wedge them in some way. Well, to get a three form, you're going to have to uh, wedge them together in some order. And whatever order I pick, suppose it's with dz, wedge, dy, wedge, dx. Well, you know what? I could switch those guys. And so that's going to be minus dz, wedge, dx, wedge, dy. And now I can switch the uh, x and the z. That's going to be dz, sorry, dx, wedge, dz wedge dy, and I'm running out of room. So, but that is equal to minus dx wedge dy wedge dz. Okay. And so, no matter what I get, I don't really get anything new. And so, in fact, there really is just one kind of three form, which makes sense because one forms have directionality to them. One forms you have these layers, and you have directionality to them. Even two forms, there's a direction 
if you have these tubes of flux coming through space, there's this sort of kind of directionality as to where the tubes are pointing. Three forms, there isn't any directionality anymore. It's just how dense are they? It's just a number. It's just a scalar for the density. There's no directionality anymore. And so, um, in fact, this is really the only thing we need. Now, we might uh, accidentally encounter stuff in different orders, and we might even leave it in different orders, but if we wanted to, we can always, with at most a sign change, bring it back to that. Okay. Um, and then the uh, F here, we'll finish up with F, that comes back to what I was talking about in two dimensions of integrating a two-form in two dimensions. Um, and that's simply that, um, and this relates to what I was just saying, there's no directionality to a three-form. So there really isn't any more information in a three-form than just a function. That's a little reminiscent of the fact that a one-form has the same amount of information as a vector field. It's just in a better form. And we'll talk about that even more uh, in another later problem. But the, um, a three-form, it's really, if I say I'm thinking of a three-form, and I tell you the F, you can guess the rest of it. It's always this form, plus or minus. That's what we just talked about. And so there really shouldn't be anything more to it, to integrating that, than, we kn than we, there is to integrating a function, which we already know how to do. And again, the trick is just delete the wedges. We know what this means, in just in the ordinary sense. So here's our new concept. Well, guess what? It's not really very new. We define it just to be in the old in terms of the old concept. But what about if we had integral of f dy wedge dx wedge dz? Well, first we would switch these guys and get a minus, and that would be minus the ordinary integral right, written without the, the wedges. Okay, but they all amount to counting boxes, and it's nice to have that cool picture.